Hey guys, welcome back to our series on the Book of Enoch. Now, as you can tell, I'm doing a very different type of video this time. And that's because in this video, I'm gonna be going through different video clips and websites where we look at how the Book of Enoch is telling the same story that other cultures of the world were all saying as well. Now, there are two reasons I wanna do this. The first one is we've already looked at how the New Testament corroborates the Book of Enoch. And so we can see, okay, the New Testament is saying the Book of Enoch is a true story. But I want to show that these other cultures are saying the same thing that the Book of Enoch said, which also corroborates that the Book of Enoch is a true story. But the reason I want to do all of that is because when you read the Book of Enoch, it's very easy to dismiss it as fiction. It's a very weird story. Okay, the Book of Enoch tells this wild story about these watchers these angels coming to earth, living on earth in physical form, marrying women, having children with those women. Those children were giants. They grew up. They lived on earth for hundreds of years. Then they fought a cataclysmic war. They wiped each other out. And those watchers were eventually locked up in the underworld waiting for judgment. It's a wild and crazy story that is very easy for us to dismiss. It also goes into how these watchers are the ones who taught us all sorts of things. They gave us secret knowledge and technology and all this sort of stuff that it's very hard for us to read that and accept that this is history. Okay, maybe we can read it and we can be like, okay, that's a very interesting story. Maybe we can read it and kind of have this dissonance where we, we you know, maybe recognize it as the Bible, but like not at the same time kind of like how a lot of christians read the bible but they don't recognize that it's a history book it's kind of like fairy tale stories that i don't know it, they, it's separated from reality in their own minds it's kind of like that we it's very easy for us to read the book of enoch and separate it from reality because it's weird but that's why i want to look at what the other cultures of the world at that time were saying because the other cultures of the world were all saying the same thing. This story told in the book of Enoch was not weird to them. They all lived significantly closer to the time of these events, and they all said, yeah, this happened. They all told it from their own perspectives, but they all agreed that this actually happened. And the only reason it's weird for us today is because in the very recent past, we have begun to be given a different version of history than what the ancients have all been saying. So now we look at history and we see it as this linear progression where we came from cavemen and we advanced all the way up to where we are today in this technological age. And we see it as more or less a linear progression with some hiccups along the way. But that's not the version of history that the ancients used to tell. That's not the version of history that was known throughout the world until very recently. And so now we come from this worldview and we read a story like the Book of Enoch and it's really weird and it's really hard for us to accept. And I want to show you that this story was not weird in the ancient past. They all agreed that this happened. And so that's what we're going to look at in this video here today. Now, it's worth pointing out that there are other people out there who talk about this. Um, these people call themselves what do they call themselves? Ancient astronaut theorists or something like that. Basically, the people who believe that aliens came to Earth in the distant past and interfered with the development of mankind. They're infamous for the Ancient Aliens TV show on the History Channel, okay? These people look at all of this evidence from the ancient world and they come to the conclusion that aliens interfered with mankind's development in the ancient past and they kind of attribute this entire story to aliens. Okay, 
we're going to look at some of their videos because quite frankly, they are the predominant people who are looking into this stuff. They're the predominant people who have videos on this topic. And so we're going to look at some of their stuff because they're pointing out very real evidence. They're pointing out very real archaeological and mythological evidence from the ancient past, the stories of these cultures and the archaeological evidence that still exists. They're pointing out very real evidence and they're coming to the conclusion that it was aliens. I don't come to that same conclusion. I've gone through the series now showing that the book of Enoch is corroborated by the New Testament. The New Testament says the book of Enoch is prophecy. It says it is scripture. It is highly referenced by Jesus and the apostles. And I hold Jesus and the apostles to be an authority. So I look at this and I say, okay, the book of Enoch is giving the correct perspective on what actually happened. Just like the ancient world looked at these beings and said they are gods, now we've got these people who are looking at these beings saying they are aliens. No, the book of Enoch tells us who they really are. They are the watchers. They are fallen angels. They are the principalities of Satan that rule over this world. We need to recognize them for who they really are. And we need to recognize that all of these people who are talking about ancient aliens are essentially worshiping the ancient gods that the ancient cultures of the world used to worship. It's all the same thing. But that doesn't stop us from being able to look at the same pieces of evidence to see that those gods that the ancient cultures worshipped were actually very real beings. It's just difference of perspective. The Book of Enoch tells us who they really were. The ancient cultures tell us what they thought of them, okay? It's very different. The Book of Enoch tells us they brought destruction. The ancient cultures and the alien people, they say that the, they taught us wonderful things. They taught us, you know science and knowledge and math and the dark arts and all of this stuff that, that has made us prosperous and wonderful. The Book of Enoch is saying, no, they taught how to make weapons. They taught how to kill one another. They taught how to seduce one another. They taught how to break your, break your oaths to one another. They brought oppression. They brought warfare. They brought murder. That's the Book of Enoch's perspective. It's very different than the ancient world who saw these beings as gods who should be worshipped. And the ancient alien astronaut theorist people, they're kind of joining in the ancient world's worldview of saying, yeah, these people were benevolent and they brought us tons of wonderful things. Very different perspectives. But we're going off of what the Book of Enoch says because the Book of Enoch, I truly believe, is bringing the correct perspective on it all. It is the outlier that is saying, no, 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 no. You guys, you guys are worshiping the wrong beings. So anyway, we're going to dive into all of this now in this video, looking at what all these other cultures said, with the point being to show you that these cultures are all telling the same story that the Book of Enoch says. They did not think this was a weird story. They are corroborating this story. If, if all of the cultures of the world separated by vast oceans are all telling the same story, then there's something to it. There's some at least fundamental origin to this story that they are all sharing in common. And so we're going to look at that and I want you to just recognize how much the ancient world is corroborating the book of Enoch and how much we can see from the ancient world that the book of Enoch is telling us a true story, even though it's weird for us to read today. It's weird for us to accept it today, but we should accept it because the ancient world accepted it. The ancient world who lived at that time said, yep, this happened. So we ought to take that into consideration ourselves and recognize that, you know, if they all said it happened and they're spread out over continents and oceans and, you know, vast distances between them and they're all telling the same story, then something clearly did happen. And that lends evidence to the fact that the book of Enoch is a true story that we should trust and not just blow off because it's weird. Okay. So Let's start going through some of this. I will just point out very quickly that this is far from exhaustive. I am basically scratching the surface just to give you a little bit to go off of and you can go look into these things more yourself. There are entire YouTube channels where this is all they talk about. So obviously I can't fit it all into one video. So this is just kind of to whet your appetite and say, hey, look, there is evidence out there. All these other cultures out there say the same thing. Go look into this because it's worth understanding that you know, these stories have a very real history behind them. Um, even if the perspective of these ancient cultures was wrong, the stories that they are telling are based on truth. And the Book of Enoch tells us what that truth is. 
But that's, that's all I'm gonna say for now. So let's get started. First thing I wanna just point out here is the Book of Enoch says that fallen angels came down to earth, they mingled with mankind, they married mankind, and they taught us all sorts of information. Did other cultures tell us the same story? Northern Iraq, along the east bank of the Tigris River, opposite the city of Mosul, lie the ruins of the ancient city of Nineveh, a place originally inhabited by the Sumerians of Mesopotamia. Here, in 1842, British archaeologist Austin Henry Layard unearthed the ruins of the Great Library of Azerbaijan, a royal archive containing thousands of clay tablets with cuneiform inscriptions. Dating to 3000 BC, the messages carved into stone are considered to be the world's first written accounts. Sumerian tablets are probably one of the oldest uh, form of a written record that we have. They've been translated and they tell exciting stories about how gods intermingled with human beings and actually had a hand in the creation of human beings. Whether or not it's just mythology or if it's fact, no one really knows. According to interpretations of the Sumerian tablets, the gods were called the Anunnaki. What we're looking at here is a Sumerian tablet that actually shows the tree of life, flanked by divine beings. You can see here the Anunnaki on each side. The written accounts etched into stone suggest the Anunnaki were giant beings, standing eight feet tall. Ancient chronicles of sky beings creating human life are common in early cultures found all over the world. But while mainstream scholars often dismiss this evidence, might such tangible historical accounts provide proof of alien intervention in man's evolution? The Sumerians are not the only culture that talks about this. Also in the Quran, it says that language was given to us by Allah or God. The Maya Popol Vuh says that language was given to us by the gods. The ancient Egyptian texts are saying the exact same thing. We should finally come to grips with the idea that extraterrestrials had something to do with our development. The exploration of Mesopotamian mythology includes two frequently found terms, Anunnaki and Ejiji. They are also found in earlier tales of deities from Sumer and Babylon. The literature that surrounds these two words usually comes in the form of Sumerian glyphs rather than the more intricate Babylonian writing. The diverse range of mentions of Anunnaki from various sources cause some trouble for historians who diligently try to figure out exactly who they were. The general idea is that they and the Ajiji were considered gods in ancient Sumer and Akkad. Although mostly mentioned as deities, these beings have also been described as wise men, regulators, sages, or even miners who work in the underworld. Therein lies the mystery for the baffled scholars. They have relegated all this material to the realm of gods and mythology, even though the Sumerians wrote it as a specific historical account. Just because we call it mythology, because it makes us more comfortable, means just that. The Anunnaki were spoken about as if they were very real, not some apparition or elusive deity. The multifaceted descriptors only add to the mystery surrounding the Anunnaki's true purpose and identity. Like the tales in which the Anunnaki interacted with people or sought out their support for a while, the special group of Ijiji did this as well. One such story that indicated their descent from heaven to interact with people involved the marriage of Marduk to Sarpanet. Whatever the specific beliefs about these two groups of holy beings, they seemed to exist across cultural lines for quite a long period of time in the ancient world. Researchers with interest in multiple cultures have found quite a lot of similarities between the Sumerian and Babylonian Anunnaki and the Nephilim, as described in the Judeo-Christian histories. 
One etymological indication of the similarities comes from the Hebrew root of NFL, as seen in the Nephilim word. This root sound represents the action of descending or falling from somewhere higher up. If the Nephilim were beings who descended, the Anunnaki name also indicates the same idea. The root An means heaven or sky, and the root Ki indicates land or the earth. Their name, therefore, simply means from sky to land, which is extremely like falling or descending. This has led some people to believe that the Nephilim are Anunnaki. They believe the terms are synonymous and just come from two different cultures. However, closer inspection of the historical documents and writings indicate that the Anunnaki is a term to describe all these beings with the Nephilim only a part of the whole. There are so many historical mythological accounts to choose from for the purpose of narrative, discussion, and insight, it would take forever to go through them all. However, the myth of Etana stands out. We see a direct connection between earthly people and these gods as if a real event has taken place, not a story, not a legend, a real historical account. However, historians don't believe in gods and have painted themselves into a corner when historical accounts speak of them in real accounts. So these other cultures in the area, in the Mesopotamian area, they told similar stories as what we read about in the Book of Enoch. Okay, The Book of Enoch says that these watchers, these angelic beings, came down from heaven, intermingled with mankind, married women and taught humanity all these different things and it says this is historical fact and as we just saw the other cultures in that region the sumerian cultures they had similar stories okay they said that these beings called the anunnaki came down from heaven intermingled with mankind we see stories about them getting married and having children and teaching mankind all sorts of stuff and what's also interesting is we saw in this video that it's saying the Sumerian culture is very clear when you read this text. They're not talking about this as mythology or fiction. It's very clearly something that they are saying this is historical fact. They're very clearly saying this actually happened. And that's something that scholars today, historians today, they don't take these things into account because they assume, they start with the presupposition that these stories cannot be true. You know, stories of gods cannot possibly be true. They start with that, and so they build off of that, and they end up coming to a completely different conclusion where they say these were obviously fictional stories that they were using to teach lessons and teach ideas and all sorts of stuff. But these cultures, when you read their texts, it's very clear that they were saying this is historical fact. And the book of Enoch is also saying this is historical fact, but they're coming from different perspectives. Again, the Sumerians saw these beings, the Anunnaki, as helpers of mankind, and the Book of Enoch is saying, no, these beings came and taught things that corrupted mankind. Similarly, we can see the Anunnaki showing up in other regions of the world. Hey guys, this is an ancient temple at Leipakshi, and here we can see this strange carving that shows a very unique deity. You can see that it has a reptilian face looking almost like a lizard and the hand gesture shows a blessing posture. When I asked the locals who this god is, they told me it is called Anunnaga. It sounds very similar to Anunnaki, the gods well known around the Mesopotamian region, which is in modern day Iraq. Anunnaki was worshipped by ancient cultures like Sumerians, Akkadians, Assyrians, and Babylonians. Now, is it just a coincidence that these names sound similar? Or is Anunnaki being worshipped in this temple as Anunnaga? The Sumerian term Anunnaki means those who from heaven came down to earth clearly describing their extraterrestrial origin. Nagas in Indian mythology also come from a different planet, and they prefer to live underground, building vast cities underneath the earth. 
This is identical to the portrayal of Anunnaki, who are the gods of the underworld. According to Sumerian texts, the Anunnaki was able to genetically modify the human race, which is possible only by altering our DNA. This genetic manipulation is depicted in ancient civilizations by intertwined serpents, which represent the DNA strands. The pillars of Leipakshi Temple show a variety of these intertwined snakes, and each carving is different from the other. Is it possible that these pillars show the same genetic experiments done by Anunnaki? Are we looking at remnants of a distant past when Anunnaki or Anunnaga landed on Earth and created these ancient civilizations? So here we see the Anunnaki, the Sumerian gods, showing up in India. And there's evidence in India that they were aware of the Anunnaki as well. And again, as I said at the beginning of this video, this is only a snippet taken out of the evidence that is there in India. There's actually a whole lot of correlations between the Babylonian and Sumerian stories and their gods and the Indian stories and their gods. But this is just to show you that, you know, they're telling the same stories in India as they're telling in Mesopotamia. In addition to all of this, you can see this exact same story being told on the other side of the world. It's one thing to say that this story is being told in the Mesopotamia Indian region where they're all kind of, you know, they're probably interacting with each other a little bit in the ancient world. But we, we can actually see this exact same story being told on the other side of the world, okay? Thousands and thousands of miles away. People who were not interacting with each other at all were telling the same story. To look at this, let's look at the Hopi Indians, okay? The Hopi Indians are a Native American tribe that's been living in Arizona for thousands of years, okay? That's, that's who they are. They've been living in the region of the Grand Canyon, and if you go out there, you can still see some of their drawings on the desert walls that exist out there. So they've been out there for thousands of years and supposedly shouldn't be influenced at all by the religions and mythology of the Sumerian area, the Mesopotamian area. It's a completely different region of the world. So scrolling down, I'm not going to read this entire article, but I want to read a little bit. Please forgive the ads that'll be popping up. One of the most intriguing Hopi legends is about the ant people, who saved the Hopi people twice during the fire, volcanic eruption, asteroid strike, ice age, or a strong coronal ejection from the sun. Essentially, they, they have stories about the Hopi people being saved by the ant people during some sort of cataclysmic event. During these two devastating events, the ant people civilization hid the Hopi people in their underground caves and provided them with food and water. These legends portray the ant people as generous and hardworking, who also taught the Hopi the secrets of storing food for a long time without spoiling. So right off the bat, we see that they've got these stories about what they call ant people who were helping mankind and teaching mankind sort all sorts of things. It goes on to say, on ancient petroglyphs all over the world, and in particular on this one from North Africa, right here, one can often find images of unusual creatures with antennae or horns on their heads. So all over the world, not just in the Hopi region, we've got these images popping up of people with these horns or antennae. So this is not limited to just the Hopi people. This is seen all over the world, including here in Africa. The ant people and ordinary ants, insects, have some kind of connection with the constellation Orion. This constellation is most clearly visible in winter when ants are hibernating. And in February, when it's the brightest in the sky, the Hopi perform a sacred dance ceremony called Powamu in the ceremonial dwelling of the Kiva. The ceremony is dedicated to a god named Anu Sinom, who long ago taught the Hopi how to grow beans and save them from hunger. Okay, so a god named Anu who taught mankind how to grow beans and save them from hunger. At the same time, there's an interesting coincidence with the fact that there is a Babylonian god with the same name, Anu, and that the ant in the Hopi language is also Anu. Okay, so the ant people in the Hopi language are called the Anu, and there's a Babylonian god named Anu, 
and the Hopi have a ceremony dedicated to a god named Anu, and that god taught them how to grow beans and save them from hunger. So we already can see this parallel starting to pop up where the Hopi people tell of this story of a god named Anu who taught them how to do something that they see as beneficial that helped them. And the Babylonians have a god named Anu that taught them something that they saw as beneficial that helped them. It goes on. And the phrase Anunnaki, which is translated from the Hopi language as ant's friend, is surprisingly similar to the Sumerian word Anunnaki, which means creatures that came to earth from heaven. Okay, so the Hopi call these people the Anunnaki. To them, it means ant friends. But the Sumerians also describe these beings that came from heaven, and they use the word Anunnaki, which describe creatures that came to earth from heaven. Anyway, the article goes on from there talking about the Anunnaki from the Hopi legends and the Sumerians and the Egyptians and kind of ties them all together. But my point right now is to just point out the fact that the Hopi in North America, in the Arizona region, go back thousands of years and they're telling the exact same story that was being told by the Babylonians and the Sumerians in the Mesopotamian region of the world. And it's literally the same name. The god Anu and the Anunnaki came to earth and taught people things. This is not a coincidence. And it's foolish for us to assume that it was just a coincidence. Clearly, something happened or there is some common origin to this story where people from all over the world are telling the same story. Okay, so at this point we can see that there are different cultures all over the world that tell stories of these beings who came to earth from heaven and taught mankind different things and intermingled with them and married with them. Another very important aspect of the story as told in the Book of Enoch is the fact that these watchers were specifically coming to earth and having children with women. They were marrying women and having children with them. And this is something that we can find in stories from other cultures as well. Uh, many other cultures told stories about their gods coming to earth and having children with women. And a lot of times, even those children then became gods themselves in these stories. But the point being that these other cultures told similar stories. For example, here I am on study.com talking about the Greek demigods. The term demigod in ancient Greek mythology refers to a person who is born to one mortal parent and one divine parent. Okay, so a demigod is someone who was born to a quote unquote god and a human. A god and a human had a child. That is what the Book of Enoch says. The Book of Enoch says that the watchers saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they came to them and they took them as wives and they had children. The Greeks said that the demigods were those children. It continues, in the stories of Greek mythology, it was not uncommon for the divine to descend into the mortal world and form relationships with humans. In fact, the king of the gods, Zeus, is infamous for it. However, not all demigods have a divine parent as powerful and important as the ruler of Mount Olympus. The divine parent could be any of the 12 Olympians, as well as any of the countless minor gods of the Greek pantheon. Similarly, we can see in the Book of Enoch that it says the children born to these watchers were giants in the earth, and they were very powerful. And the Greeks said those who were born as demigods were said to have powers beyond that of a normal mortal. It was these powers that allowed demigods to become heroes in Greek society. And then we've got a list here of some examples of some of these demigods. A lot of these we've heard of. Achilles, Aeneas, Heracles or Hercules, Helen of Sparta and of Troy, Orion, Orpheus, Perseus, Theseus. And then it goes on to talk about some of their stories and the things that were told about them. My point being, the Greeks very much told stories of the gods having children with mortal women. That was very common in the Greek world. And we should also just note that the Romans told the same stories as the Greeks. They just used different names. That's why you have Heracles, that's the Greek name. Hercules is the Roman name. It's the exact same being the Romans and the Greeks told the same stories. So, so we've got the Greeks and the Romans all talking about gods having children with mortal women. Here we are on Wikipedia's entry for demigods, and we can just look at how other cultures told similar stories. For example, we have the Celtic warrior 
I'm not going to be able to pronounce that name. He's the son of the Irish god Lug and the mortal princess Daktine. I'm sure I'm not saying that right. So, the son of a god and a mortal woman. In China, we've got some demigods as well. It says, among the demigods in Chinese mythology, Erlang Shen and Chen Zhang are most prominent. In the journey to the west, the, Ch the Jade Emperor's younger sister, Yao Ji, is mentioned to have descended to the mortal realm and given birth to a child named Yang Zhen. He would eventually grow up to become a deity himself known as Erlang Shen. Sorry that I'm pronouncing all of these wrong. Chen Zhang is nephew of Erlang Shen, so he's the nephew of this first uh, demigod. He, he was birthed by Erlang Shen's younger sister, Hua Yu Sanyang, who married with a mortal scholar. So again, we've got gods marrying mortals and having children in China. In Japan, we've got a story here. I'm going to just try to skip over these names because I can't pronounce any of these. Uh, but we have a human father and a divine mother. In the Philippines, we've got many demigods. They abound in various ethnic stories. And it goes on here to talk about who some of them were in their stories. We can look at Polynesian, Samoan, Tongan, Maori, Hawaii. They all had their own stories, and these are linked to where you can go read their own mythology, where they talk about their demigods. So we can see that demigods, these part human, part divine offspring of a deity and a human, these stories abounded in all of these ancient cultures. They all told about the gods having children with human women. And that is exactly what the Book of Enoch says, only instead of calling them gods, it calls them watchers. Enoch is saying, these beings came down, married women and had children, and taught mankind all sorts of things. And the Greeks are saying, our gods are these gods who came down and married and had lots of children and taught us all sorts of things. Very different perspective. The Greeks are saying these are our gods, and Enoch is saying these are fallen angels and they're being punished and waiting for judgment. Very different perspectives, but essentially, at its core, it's the same story. And what's really interesting is the fact that all sorts of ancient mythologies, they, they have this idea of the gods marrying and having children is a core part of their mythology. It's, it's very common. It's a common thread found all across the world. The gods are marrying and having children. This is something that is a core part of pretty much every ancient mythology. And so once again, there is a common thread that we can find in other cultures where they're telling the same stories that the Book of Enoch is saying. In addition to that, the Book of Enoch goes on to talk about how their children were giants. And all sorts of cultures had stories of giants. So here I am again on Wikipedia, and this is just looking at a list of giants in mythology and folklore. So, you know, it says this is a list of giants and giantesses from mythology and folklore. It does not include giants from modern fantasy fiction or role playing games. So this is only talking about mythology and folklore. This is not talking about giants from modern stories. OK, so this is ancient mythology, ancient folklore. Did other cultures talk about giants as well, or is that something that only the Book of Enoch and the Bible talk about? Well, no, you can see right here that obviously it's about to go into a ton of different cultures all over the world and how they talked about giants. So if we scroll down, we can see, okay, the Abrahamic regions. This is Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Proto-Indo-European mythology. Okay, these are what the ones we are familiar with. We've got Goliath in here, Og, Nimrod, we've got the Nephilim, um, the Anakim. These are the, the beings that we are most familiar with. Some of them are from Islam and uh, Proto-Indo-Europeans, so maybe we're not familiar with all of these. But generally speaking, when people talk about giants, we, we tend to think of, oh, the Bible says there were giants. And that's because in the Western world, this is our background. And a lot of people think that this is the only source of giants in the ancient world. But that's actually not true. And I'm not going to read through all of the names because, quite frankly, there are hundreds of them. Um, but I'm just going to show that this is something that was found in mythologies all over the world. If we keep scrolling, we can see in Africa, they talked about giants. In Armenia, they had stories of giants. In Australia, they had stories of giants. The Celtic mythology had stories of giants. Chinese folklore had stories of giants. Tibetan mythology, 
Dutch folklore, English folklore. We've got a huge list here, and one of them's not even mentioned that I happen to know of. Many of my viewers might be interested to learn that uh, British mythology tells a story of a giant that they still honor to this day. They still have statues of him set up. Uh, this giant is named Gog Magog. So you might be interested to go look up that a little bit more. We've got Finnic mythologies, Norse mythologies. There's tons of giants in Norse mythology. You can just keep scrolling there. Okay. Uh, Sami folklore, French folklore, German folklore, Greek and Roman mythology. They had tons of giants in Greek and Roman mythology. Basque mythology, Cantabrian mythology. We've got the Indian religions, Hindu mythology, Jainism, Japanese folklore, Malaysian folklore, North American folklore. Tons of giants all over the world. Fijian, Maori, Persian, Philippine, Romanian, Slavic, Bulgarian, South American, Brazilian, Chilean. So all over the world, different ancient cultures talked about giants. So this is something that's worth noting because I've run into a number of people who, when you start talking about giants existing in the world, I even, I, I had a conversation very recently with someone online where I mentioned giants and evidence for giants. And this person was like, the Bible is not evidence. You know, obviously this is the response I expect from a lot of atheists in the world today. But I responded, I was like, I, I, I'm not even talking about just the Bible. This is all over the world. All ancient cultures talked about giants. You can't just say, you can't just dismiss the Bible and think that you're dismissing all stories of giants. No, this is all over the world. Cultures and the ancient world was telling us that there were giants that lived on the earth. And this is what the book of Enoch says. This is what the Bible says. You know, these, these stories are definitely backed up by the Bible. And the Bible is certainly one place where you can find stories of giants. And the book of Enoch says this. But I just want to point out that this is not some weird thing that the Bible alone talks about or the book of Enoch alone talks about. This is something that we can find all over the world. All of the ancient cultures said there were giants on the earth. And they all lived closer to the time. We should assume that they knew more about ancient history than we do today because they lived a lot closer to it. One other thing that's worth mentioning about all these stories of giants is that the Book of Enoch says that these giants consumed all the resources of the world and then when they had consumed them all they began consuming mankind itself they were cannibals they were eating humans many 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 of these stories include cannibalism the giants specifically were cannibals in almost all of these ancient stories it talks about them eating humans so we have you know these parallels there and I'll let you, you can, you can go and read about these and, you know, look up videos on YouTube and stuff about the giants and different mythology and learn about it yourself. But you can see these, this very common theme where these giants were cannibals. Another very interesting thing is in the Bible, we can read stories about some of these giants and it talks about how they have six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. And when you get to in North America, at the very least, I know that in uh, Native American mythologies, they talk about uh, giants that have six fingers and six toes. So we've got these parallels. In North America, we've got Native Americans saying the exact same thing that the Bible says from the other side of the world. And, you know, again, this is this is when, you know, Europeans first came to America. Supposedly, these Northern American tribes, these Native American tribes were untouched and unreached and had never heard anything about, you know, all of that. And yet they've got the same stories. So it's very interesting when you go and you look into all these stories from all over the world talking about giants and how they are very, very similar. And the Book of Enoch lines up with them all. And it's just one example of what the ancient world had to say about giants. Now I'm going to come back to giants in our next video where we look at actual physical evidence that still exists on Earth for these giants. Because, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, well, all the cultures said there were giants. And it's another thing to say, well, there's actually physical proof. And we're going to come back to that because there is actually physical proof. But for now, I just want to point out as I'm going through how the Book of Enoch lines up with mythologies of all, all the ancient cultures. I just want to point out that when the Book of Enoch says the Watchers came and had children and those children were giants. 
that matches up with what all of the ancient cultures were saying as well. To the ancient world, this was not a weird, strange thing. This was something that they knew to be fact. And the only reason it's weird to us today is because we have been raised in a culture that is trying to convince us that these things are not true and trying to convince us that these stories are weird. Cultures all around the world are all saying there were giants that existed and the Book of Enoch is just one of them. So that's just more proof to back up that the Book of Enoch is in line with all the other cultures, all the other historical evidence. The Book of Enoch is right there in line with it all. So we've got the Watchers came down, they were intermingling with mankind, they were marrying women, they had children, those children were giants. The Book of Enoch also goes into detail talking about the fact that these Watchers taught mankind all sorts of things. And we've already seen that very briefly when we were looking at the Hopi and there's the Anunnaki with the Sumerians. We've seen very briefly some aspects of that, but I want to look at that in a little more detail because this is an aspect of the story that is also repeated throughout other cultures. Now, to start off, I'm going to show a very brief clip from Dr. Michael Heiser. Now, Dr. Heiser is one of the very few scholars even willing to talk about the Book of Enoch. However, he does not view it as scripture. He does not see it as inspired. He rejects all of the arguments that I've been putting forward in my entire series. So, so understand that he's coming from a different perspective on all of this. But Dr. Heiser is an expert in the ancient Mesopotamian region and their histories and their languages and that sort of thing. He knows a lot of information. And one of the things he points out is that the Babylonians very strongly viewed that their gods taught them information. And so let's look at that. You have interference, the sons of God with humanity. And in the Babylonian version, they teach us wonderful things. You know, they, they teach us about, you know, drugs and they teach us about astrology and they teach us about dark arts. They teach us how to do, you know, all sorts of things. And we're Babylon, we're the greatest civilization on the earth. You know, we conquer everyone, okay? But to the Israelites, it's like what these guys did, the sons of God, these divine beings, you know, coming down, you know, cohabiting with women and all that stuff and producing Nephilim, what this was the result of was in our case, we're just Israel. In our case, their descendants tried to wipe us out at Canaan. So they were lethal threats. And what they taught people corrupted humanity. It, it, it led to the proliferation of depravity. So Dr. Heiser is essentially saying the Babylonians looked at these events and said, these are our gods. They taught us the dark arts and science and, and math and all sorts of things. We, we respect them and we revere them. And the Israelites were saying, no, those were the watchers and they, they caused corruption and horrible awfulness happened because of them. And he's showing that they had these very different perspectives, but it's important to note that he is saying the Babylonians very strongly viewed that the gods, their gods that they worshipped were these beings who taught them a lot of information. That's something that I think a lot of people don't realize when they look at ancient mythology is they say, oh, you know, this is the god of agriculture and this is the god of sailing and this is the god of war. And what they don't understand is that the mythologies of the ancient world, these mythologies, their stories are not just about the gods being the god you pray to in this particular situation for agriculture or warfare or whatever, but they see it as the God who taught them about that in the first place, the God who gave them that in the first place. That is the ancient view of the gods. And we can see a little bit more of this when we look at a few other cultures. For example, in Greek mythology, we read about Prometheus. Prometheus is the Greek God who gave mankind fire. Zeus deemed humans subservient creatures vulnerable to the elements and dependent on the gods for protection. Zeus forbade the use of fire on earth, whether to cook meat or for any other purpose. But Prometheus refused to see his creations denied this resource. And so he scaled Mount Olympus to steal fire from the workshop of Hephaestus and Athena. He hid the flames in a hollow fennel stalk and brought it safely down to the people. This gave them the power to harness nature for their own benefit and ultimately dominate the natural order. With fire, humans could care for themselves with food and warmth. 
but they could also forge weapons and wage war. Prometheus's flames acted as a catalyst for the rapid progression of civilization. When Zeus looked down at this scene, he realized what had happened. Furious, Zeus imposed a brutal punishment. Prometheus was to be chained to a cliff for eternity. Although Prometheus remained in perpetual agony, he never expressed regret at his act of rebellion. His resilience in the face of oppression made him a beloved figure in mythology. He was also celebrated for his mischievous and inquisitive spirit and for the knowledge, progress, and power he brought to human hands. He's also a recurring figure in art and literature. In Percy Bysshe Shelley's lyrical drama Prometheus Unbound, the author imagines Prometheus as a romantic hero who escapes and continues to spread empathy and knowledge. Of his protagonist, Shelley wrote, Prometheus is the type of the highest perfection of moral and intellectual nature, impelled by the purest and the truest motives to the best and noblest ends. His wife Mary envisaged Prometheus as a more cautionary figure and subtitled her novel Frankenstein, The Modern Prometheus. This suggests the damage of corrupting the natural order and remains relevant to the ethical questions surrounding science and technology today. As hero, rebel, or trickster, Prometheus remains a symbol of our capacity to capture the powers of nature. And ultimately, he reminds us of the potential of individual acts to ignite the world. So we can see in this story from the Greeks that they saw the gods as the beings that came and gave different gifts. In this case, Prometheus gave the gift of fire to mankind. Similarly, if we look at Babylonian mythology, uh, as Heiser already alluded to, they had stories about the gods giving mankind different knowledge and information. For example, the god Nabu was the god who gave the gift of writing to mankind. And this is really interesting because the Book of Enoch specifically says the Watchers are the ones who taught mankind how to write. Despite not necessarily possessing any destructive power, or showcasing much in the way of aptitude for battle, or physical strength for that matter, Nabu would actually be raised to the heights of co-regent alongside Marduk, which is quite a feat when you consider that Marduk had warred against the other gods in order to assert his position as the head of the pantheon. Using what one might say was strategy, diligence, and certain wit, Nabu was able to ascend the chain of command in a much less violent fashion, and would even coexist alongside Marduk for a time. In some accounts, most notably at the ancient Babylonian province of Borsippa, Nabu was detailed as the minister and scribe of Marduk, and whilst this might sound like he was an underling to Marduk, his position was nothing to scoff at. As a scribe, he inherited the responsibilities as the god of writing, and thus became the patron of scholars, scribes, and generally the folks who would be keeping an account of the gods in the first place. This gave him an edge over his competition, for the scholars and scribes would always look favourably upon Nabu, and portray him positively, for it was he who had blessed them with knowledge in the first place. Writing itself was thought to have been invented by the Sumerians, sometime in the years 3500 to 3000 BC, though back then it was known as tuniform, and consisted of wedge-shaped mugs that were made in wet clay and then set to dry. Writing itself, although a necessity when it came to trade, was primarily seen as a gift from the gods. So once more, it makes sense that the patron god of writing was held in such high esteem. In other ideas, Nabu was also responsible for the visions brought to regular men, and it was with Nabu's insights that one could prepare for a good or bad harvest. As far as the actual mythology goes, however, Nabu's antics are surprisingly hard to come by. We understand that he would marry the goddess Tashmit, she who was a goddess of hearing. Whilst never invoked alone, it was believed that Tashmit could be called upon in tandem with Nabu, and that she would attune the hearing of a mortal so that he might hear the prophecy and wisdom that Nabu had to offer. Okay, so here we've got timelessmyths.com, 
and we're going to be looking specifically at the Babylonian god of wisdom whose name was Nabu. Uh, he's the Babylonian wisdom and writing god as well as the second most important deity in Babylonian mythology. So just real quick looking at this particular god we come down and this whole article talks about who he was and the different mythology about him and all sorts of stuff but we just want to uh, look at the parallels between the babylonian mythology and what the book of enoch says and show that they're saying the same thing okay the book of enoch says that the watchers came down and taught mankind all sorts of secrets and it lists those out as being uh, anything from making weapons to making makeup to making practicing dark arts various things that sound like technology and science and all sorts of stuff like that. The Book of Enoch says that these things were taught by the Watchers. Well, here's the Babylonian account. If we come down here to this section right here, it says, the ancient Mesopotamians believed that their gods were responsible for giving them everything. Art, culture, technology, and law were all gifts from the gods. To the Babylonians, not only was Nabu the son of their most powerful deity, but he also invented and bestowed writing to civilization. So you can see here in this one very brief paragraph that the Babylonians were essentially telling the exact same story that Enoch told, but from a different perspective. The Babylonians worshipped these gods and saw these gifts as good things, but the Book of Enoch is saying the exact same story. However, it's saying these were fallen angels who came and taught mankind things that caused corruption. These were bad things. So this is just one example here uh, where we can see different cultures having the exact same story as the Book of Enoch, but from a different perspective. If we keep looking around, we can see this same theme throughout all sorts of different cultures of the ancient world, the Celtics, the Norse, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the ancient cultures of the world all saw the gods as these beings who provided mankind with information, among other things. They had their own tales, their own stories, but one of the main things was that these gods came and taught mankind information. For example, if you know anything about the ancient world, you know that the Egyptian culture was considered the pinnacle of society. They were the most advanced people in the ancient world. They were revered even by the Greeks and the Romans. Long after the height of the Egyptian Golden Age, the Egyptians were still remembered as this mighty civilization with advanced knowledge. So if we look at the Egyptians, one of the first things we can see is that the ancient Egyptian temples, which worshiped these other gods, they functioned as places of worship and centers of wisdom and learning. If we scroll down, we can read more about that. Ever since ancient times, priests have performed a variety of roles in Egyptian society. In addition to their roles as interpreters of divine will and guardians of temples, priests acted as scholars, teachers, astronomers, mathematicians, doctors, and architects. Temples served as centers of learning, and priests aided the pharaoh in the complex task of governing the country. So, here we can see these ancient priests to these gods served as more than just priests. That's something that a lot of modern day people don't realize. The ancient religions were where you got scholars and teachers and astronomers and mathematicians and doctors and architects. The temples were centers of learning. This is something about ancient religion that most people don't realize today. Ancient religion was centered around learning and gaining knowledge. Why? Because those things were things that were given to mankind by the gods, by the watchers. The watchers came and gave mankind these things, and that is why the temples were dedicated to learning, and the priests were those who were passing on that information to others. Now, this brings up a larger point that I'm not really going to dive into 100% because it's not really the point of this video, but I want to just point out very quickly that we need to realize that all of ancient humanity, including the Book of Enoch, which was endorsed by Jesus and the Apostles, all of ancient humanity says that the advancement of mankind, these, these things that we see here in this list, scholars, teachers, astronomers, mathematicians, doctors, architects, and many, many other things, the centers of learning, these things did not come from God. 
These things came from the watchers. These things came from the enemy of God, from Satan. And they were given to mankind by the watchers, not by God. And if that's true, which again, Jesus and the apostles endorsed the book of Enoch. If that's true, then we need to recognize that many of the things that we aspire to today in our culture might actually be things that God hates. And that's something that I think is worth spending our time thinking about because a lot of Christians are building their lives doing something that God never wanted us to do in the first place. And they think that doing it is a way for them to worship God. And they say, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. But as we talk about in our Dead Church series, which is another series on our channel, it's on our website, you can go check it out. In that series, we talk about the fact that you know, that Bible verse, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God is completely taken out of context because that context is actually Paul telling the Corinthians, you can't just do whatever you want. We're supposed to be doing the things that God wants us to do. And the Bible is full of commands of what he wants us to do. And it says that true worship is doing those things. So when we then go do something else and say we're doing it in order to worship God, we're actually just deceiving ourselves because the commands of God and the commands of Jesus is how God told us to worship him. And he told us not to worship him the way that the nations worship their gods. And this right here is how the nations worshiped their gods. So it's just worth thinking about. I'm, I'm not going to keep going on this topic because it's not my point for this video, but I want to just stress very briefly here that Maybe we need to reconsider our priorities and recognize that some of the things that we love in our culture are actually directly given to us by Satan, by the watchers, by the enemy of God, the fallen angels. And that should sober us. If we have ears to hear and eyes to see, that should sober us and get us to reconsider some of our own priorities. So anyway, let's keep looking at this. Similar to how all of these cultures have stories about the gods giving knowledge and information, it's also worth noting that all of these cultures have a story of a flood. You can read here, again, on TimelessMyths.com. In many ancient cultures and religions, there are stories of creation myths. These myths normally tell of how the gods created the world and mankind. There are some common stories of how the gods were themselves born, their wars against the elder gods, and probably the most interesting is the story of a great flood with few human survivors. Many ancient cultures and religions had stories of the gods who were themselves born, these would be the first generation children of the Watchers, their wars, this is what the Book of Enoch says as well, that they fought a cataclysmic war, and the story of a great flood with few human survivors. This is not something that's limited to the Judeo-Christian worldview. This is something that all of the ancient cultures taught. It says right here, the best known story of the flood can be found in the Bible. Obviously, we're all familiar with that, but can also be found in Mesopotamia, Greece, Scandinavia, India, China, and even from the Australian Aborigines. Each culture has its own version of the flood. The Greeks called it the deluge. And then as you go on and you read through this article, you can read all sorts of different stories about the flood and these gods and all the stories surrounding them, which I'm not going to go into now. But you can go and you can read these stories in other cultures and from other uh, mythologies and you can see that they're telling the same story as the Bible and as the book of Enoch and so if we recognize that the Bible is true and the book of Enoch is true then we need to recognize that these other cultures these mythologies these things that we talk about as myth and we've been taught our whole lives are just myth and fictional stories are actually these other cultures telling the same stories that the Bible says they're telling the same historical accounts. And yes, I am confident that many of them have been embellished over the course of hundreds or thousands of years, but the fact remains that these cultures are telling the same stories as the Bible and the Book of Enoch. And if they're telling the same stories, then we need to recognize that these are not just fictional myth, but they are rooted in true historical accounts, and they're telling the stories of the Watchers, the enemies of God who rebelled against God and came down to earth and taught mankind things that man was never supposed to know. And as you go on and you read 
through these different stories, you can read about, you know, the Norse gods, the Norse giants, Loki, Thor, Odin. We need to start recognizing that these beings are fallen angels. These are beings that actually exist and are on the side of the enemy. And we need to stop celebrating and loving the stories that come up in ancient mythology or even today that revere these gods and worship them and are built around them. It's time that we start recognizing that there is a good and evil in the spiritual realm and there are good and evil spiritual beings. And the gods of other cultures are all those evil spiritual watchers who came down and taught mankind these things in the ancient, ancient past. Now, it's also interesting to note that many of these gods are the same god across many different cultures and religions. And you can see that when you look at the mythology and compare them to different cultures and religions. For example, the Greeks have the god Zeus. He is the head god we've all heard of Zeus. However, you can see right here, he is the king of thunder and the Greek version of the Roman god, Jupiter. He is the Greek version of the Roman god, Jupiter. He is the Greek version of the Norse god, Odin. Or maybe Thor, depending on how you look at the mythology. But it's the same being being worshipped in different cultures. And this is something that is widely recognized even among secular scholars. They all recognize that these gods were being worshipped by different names in different cultures, but they referred to essentially the same being with many very similar stories. So you can see across all of these cultures, they're all telling the same story. They're all saying the gods came to earth, they intermingled amongst us, some of them married, they had children, there were giants, and they taught us stuff. All of these cultures telling the same story. And what's really interesting is that a lot of times you can tell, if you really study the mythology of these ancient cultures, you can tell that these different cultures are all talking about not just the same general story, but the same individuals. So they all have this character and they all have this character and they all have this character. So in other words, you can see when you look at these ancient mythologies, you can see not just the same overarching story, but you can see the same characters in that story portrayed in different cultures. Here's an example. This is the names for the sky god from several different traditions. So in the Vedas, they make reference to a god, Dios Pither, and it's literally referring to, in Dios, it's referring to sky, and we already talked about Pither being the word for father. So it's referring to this idea of sky father. And some of you might be getting goosebumps now when you see where this is going. Well, in Greek, we have a very similar word. Instead of Dios, we have Zeus. And those are very similar words. The spelling might be different, but the way it comes out of your mouth is very similar. Dios or Dios, Zeus. Instead of Pither, you have Pater. Once again, you have Sky, you have Sky Father. Sky Father right over here. And this is another connection that blew my mind. It wasn't obvious when I first saw it, but Jupiter from Latin, the Roman god. You could use Jupiter. This is once again, instead of Deus, you have Ju. Instead of Pither, you have Pitter. So instead of Dios Pitter, you have Jupiter. Deus Pitter, Jupiter. These are very, very similar words, even though the spelling seems different. The way it comes out of your mouth is very, 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 very close. And this is further evidence for the closeness between Sanskrit, between Greek, and between Latin. So once again, we have sky father. And this is, of course, an image of, well, it's hard to tell whether that's Jupiter or Zeus. I believe this is a picture of Jupiter. And what's also interesting is the Vedas cite Dios Pitar as the father of Indra, 
who's considered the king of the gods, one of the most significant, if not the most significant god in Hinduism. And Indra is now, in, especially in the Vedas, and this is the most spoken about god in the Vedas, has many of the qualities that we now in, in Greek and Roman traditions associate with Zeus and Jupiter. Indra is a sky god, throws bolts of lightning, actually eerie similar, similarities with the Nordic god of Thor, where and Nordic people were also Indo-European people, where Indra, he throws a hammer and he defeats these monsters and all of these things, very similar to Thor. So hopefully this, you know, when I first learned this, this just kind of made me realize how connected the world is and it started to make me start to look for patterns uh, where I hadn't seen them before. And it really shows how these, these civilizations that seemed very unconnected might have, and probably we do believe, emerged in are emerged from the same place. Modern philologists and, and historians believe that this Proto-Indo-European might have been spoken by people in the Caucasus. The word Caucasian is referring really to pe this people from that Caucasus area there. But we don't know for sure. And we believe that they migrated out. And so when we talk about uh, the Germanic tribes going into Northern Europe, the Celtic tribes going into I guess you could say North, South, Central Europe. You could talk about the Italic, the Latin tribes. You could talk about the Greek tribes, and you could also talk about the in. You could also talk about the Indo-Aryan tribes, which eventually would settle into Persia and into Northern India. These, we believe, are all connected. So there we've got a representation from the Indians, from the Greeks, and from the Romans, all talking about the same being. They've got very similar names for that being, and they've got very similar stories for that being. This is very similar to how earlier we saw that the Hopi and the Sumerians, opposite sides of the world, both have stories about a god named Anu and the Anunnaki who helped them. When you look at the cumulative evidence, it's very clear that there is an origin for all of this. It's not just something that all of these cultures independently made up. They're not each independently making up the story, and neither is Enoch. Enoch is a historically accurate story that is backed up by the Bible, it's backed up by the New Testament, it's backed up by Jesus, it's backed up by the apostles, and it's backed up by the histories of all these other cultures that lived in the ancient world. They all said this happened, and that is evidence. Modern historians and modern scientists discount that as evidence and they just dismiss the whole thing as ever happening. They say, nope, that never happened. We came from cavemen. No, we didn't. You can't dismiss the fact that all these cultures all over the world all tell the same story, even though they're separated sometimes by vast oceans. This is clearly a historical event that happened that each culture has maybe embellished in their own way over time, but clearly... There is something that happened in the ancient past. There's no way to avoid that conclusion when you really look into it. But finally, to finish going through the Enoch story, uh, the book of Enoch tells us about how God's punishment on these watchers for coming down is that they were going to have to be witnesses as their children, these giants, slaughter each other in a cataclysmic war. And this is, this is another crucial part of this story, which is backed up by all sorts of ancient cultures. Ancient cultures all talked about a massive war that had occurred in the ancient distant past. They all tell this story as well. There was a cataclysmic war that occurred. And this is yet again something that we don't, we're not taught this in school. We're not taught, oh yeah, there was a, there was a cataclysmic war that occurred, you know, thousands of years ago that, you know, was majorly destructive and nearly wiped out everybody on the earth. Like, no, we're not taught this. And yet all these cultures tell these stories about how there was a terrible, terrible time to live because the gods were fighting each other. Let's take a look. In Greek mythology, we have the story of the Titanomachy. The Titanomachy is often known as the War of the Titans or uh, the Clash of the Titans is another name that's given to it. But it's basically the story of the Titans and the Greek gods all fighting a giant cataclysmic war. And you can read about this on all sorts of different websites and watch different videos on it. And it's important to note that, you know, they've got very detailed stories that it's easy to dismiss when you read these stories and or you watch a video about what all happened in these stories because, 
you know, it's it's mixed in with a lot of their own storytelling and embellishment that happened during the ancient world. And a lot of things that are just, you know, it's very weird for us because we have so been raised to think a certain thing about the ancient past that we then read these things and it's like, well, that's obviously fake. And we dismiss it very easily. And we need to get past that. We need to start recognizing the difference between what is history and what's embellishment in mythology. Because yes, there is embellishment, but there's also a lot of foundational truths that run through all sorts of ancient history. The Greeks telling very similar stories to what the Book of Enoch says, very similar to what the Indians say, very similar to what many ancient cultures said. There was a cataclysmic war in the ancient past and the greeks tell us about the titanomachy in which the gods fought against the titans and eventually won and at the end of the war the olympians were on the winning side all titans except Themis and prometheus were jailed in tartarus and that's very important we'll come back to that in just a minute and they were guarded by the hecatonkeries zeus along with poseidon and hades then all began ruling the universe and they were the the gods that supposedly won. Now, we can read more about this and we can see all of this in all the specific stories that they told about, you know, how they won and how they fought this. But the point, the really fundamental point that we need to come back to is the fact that the Greeks told this story that there was a cataclysmic war between the gods in the ancient world. That's really important because the book of Enoch tells us that in the ancient world, there was a cataclysmic war between the children of the Watchers, these giant beings who many of them became, became re revered and worshipped as gods themselves. So it's not just the Watchers, but even their children were revered and worshipped as gods. And the book of Enoch says they fought a cataclysmic war that wreaked a ton of destruction. The book of Enoch says that and the Greeks are fundamentally saying the same thing, okay? They've got a lot of stories that sound very weird when you read these stories, but fundamentally, the root of the story is there was an ancient cataclysmic war between the gods. That is huge. So anyway, we read in the book of Enoch that the children of the Watchers wiped each other out in a cataclysmic war and that the Watchers were forced to watch this all happen. They were forced to witness all of this. And then they themselves got locked up in the abyss, in darkness, in, in places of darkness where they're waiting for their judgment. That's what the book of Enoch says. And it's worth noting that that is exactly what the Greek texts say as well. They say that there was this cataclysmic war and at the end of the war, the beings in that war got locked up in Tartarus. And that's really important to note. That is the Greek version of this account is this giant war happened and then these beings were locked up in Tartarus because the New Testament corroborates that story as being the same story Enoch told and the New Testament corroborates that story as being a true story. We're raised in school and, and taught our whole lives that Greek mythology is all fiction and yet the New Testament actually corroborates it. Because when you recognize that the book of Enoch is telling the same story as the Greeks, admittedly from a different perspective, and the Greek stories were embellished and all sorts of stuff. But when you recognize that they're fundamentally telling the same story, and then you recognize what the New Testament has to say about it, you have to admit, if you believe the New Testament is truth and it is the Bible, it is scripture that is from God, you have to recognize the New Testament is saying that these Greek myths are true or at least the origins of those stories, is a true story, whether or not it's been embellished. So what am I talking about? Well, we got to remember that the New Testament was written in Greek to a predominantly Greek audience, for the most part, with some exceptions. Much of the New Testament was written in Greek to a Greek audience. These original people who would have been reading these letters in the New Testament they were very familiar with Greek mythology because they were Greek. They, they knew these stories. This was their background. This was their heritage. They knew these things very, very well. And in the book of 2 Peter, Peter is talking about the story told in Enoch, but he uses the Greek terminology because that's what they're all familiar with. Let's look at it. 
When angels sinned, God did not spare them, but he sent them to Tartarus and put them in caves of darkness where they are being held for judgment. So here in 2 Peter 2, verse 4, we see that Peter is referencing the story that's told in the book of Enoch about angels who left their proper place, they came down, they slept with women, all of that stuff, they sinned. But Peter is speaking to his Greek audience. He tells them, you know, you know this story. You know that when the angels sinned, God did not spare them, but he locked them up in Tartarus. His Greek audience would have known this story because in the Greek story, after the giant cataclysmic war that occurred in the ancient past, those who lost that war were locked up in Tartarus. This was the Greek version of the account. The beings in the ancient past were locked up in Tartarus. And Peter, writing to a Greek audience, is saying, you already know that when the angels sinned, they were locked up in Tartarus. Peter is corroborating the Greek story here. And so it's worth noting that Peter, living back then, living 2,000 years ago, he understood that the Jewish scriptures and the Greek stories were all telling the same historical account. They were telling the same story from different perspectives. Peter recognized that. We don't recognize it today because we come from the worldview where we believe that all of these stories are just myth, that they're fiction, that the Greeks just love telling a bunch of fiction. No, these were historical accounts. So anyway, we have here in the New Testament, Peter is referencing these Greek stories of these Greek wars and other events. And he is giving credence to the fact that this was talking about real events that occurred. That's really my point. The, the stories of Greek mythology corroborate the stories in the Book of Enoch. However, I also want to point out another story because... Um, you know, there are different cultures all tell these different stories. And I want to point your attention to the Indian epics. So all the way over in India, they also said that there was an ancient cataclysmic war that caused a ton of destruction. And in order to reference this, I want to look at the book Technology of the Gods, The Incredible Sciences of the Ancients by David Hatcher Childress. And we're going to come back to this book a little bit more in the next video. But in this book, in chapter six, he is describing the stories as are handed down to us in ancient Indian epics, in, in their ancient religious texts. And just like the Greeks had their stories and it was talking about their gods from their perspective and telling all these stories from their perspective, the Indians also had the same stories which they told from their perspective. And so he's outlining their story here, and I want to just read a few snippets from this. He says... The Rama Empire, described in the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, was supposedly contemporaneous with the great cultures of Atlantis and Osiris in the West. Atlantis, well known from Plato's writings and ancient Egyptian records, apparently existed in the mid-Atlantic and was a very highly technological and patriarchal civilization. As we have noted, the Osirian civilization existed in the Mediterranean Basin and North Africa, according to esoteric doctrine and archaeological evidence. The Rama Empire flourished during the same period. As noted above, the ancient Indian epics describe a series of horrific wars, wars which could have been between ancient India and Atlantis. The Mahabharata and the Drona Parva, another ancient Indian epic, speak of the war and of the weapons used. Great fireballs that could destroy a whole city. Kapila's glance, which could burn 50,000 men to ashes in seconds. And flying spears that could ruin whole cities full of forts. It was at the height of power for both the Rama Empire and Atlantis that the war allegedly broke out, seemingly because of Atlantis's attempt to subjugate Rama. Equipped with a formidable force and a fantastic array of weapons, the Atlanteans landed in their Vailixi outside of one of the Rama cities, got their troops in order, and sent a message to the ruling priest king of the city that he should surrender. The priest king sent word back to the Atlantean general. We of India have no quarrel with you of Atlantis. We ask only that we be permitted to follow our own way of life. 
Regarding the ruler's mild request as a confession of weakness, and expecting an easy victory as the Rama Empire did not possess the technology of war nor the aggressiveness of the Atlanteans, the Atlantean general sent another message. We shall not destroy your land with the mighty weapons at our command, provided you pay sufficient tribute and accept the rulership of Atlantis. The priest king of the city responded humbly again, seeking to avert war. We of India do not believe in war and strife, peace being our ideal. Neither would we destroy you or your soldiers who but follow orders. However, if you persist in your determination to attack us without cause and merely for the purpose of conquest, you will leave us no recourse but to destroy you and all your leaders. Depart and leave us in peace. Arrogantly, the Atlanteans did not believe that the Indians had the power to stop them, certainly not by technical means. At dawn, the Atlantean army began to march on the city. From a high viewpoint, the priest king sadly watched the army advance. Then he raised his arms heavenward, and he caused the general, and then each officer in order of rank, to drop dead in his tracks. In a panic and without leaders, the remaining Atlantean force fled to the waiting Velixi and retreated in terror to Atlantis. Of the sieged Rama city, not one man was lost. While this may be nothing but fanciful conjecture, the Indian epics go on to tell the rest of the horrible story and things that do not turn out well for Rama. Atlantis, assuming the above story is true, was not pleased at the humiliating defeat and therefore used its most powerful and destructive weapon. These are the verses from the ancient Mahabharata. It was a single projectile charged with all the power of the universe, an incandescent column of smoke and flame as bright as the thousand suns rose in all its splendor. It was an unknown weapon, an iron thunderbolt, a gigantic messenger of death which reduced to ashes the entire race of the Vrishnis and the Anhakas. The corpses were so burned as to be unrecognizable. The hair and nails fell out. Pottery broke without apparent cause, and the birds turned white. After a few hours, all foodstuffs were infected. To escape from this fire, the soldiers threw themselves in streams to wash themselves in their equipment. So here we have an Indian epic also describing this ancient war that occurred where entire cities were destroyed in a single moment, okay? I mean, we're talking, again, if we look back through the Book of Enoch at what was going on at this time, we see that the Watchers were teaching mankind all sorts of things and providing them with, with mighty weapons and the ability to fight wars and all this stuff. These angels from heaven who knew all these secret things were coming down and teaching those things to man. And the book of Enoch says there was a cataclysmic war. The Greeks say there was a cataclysmic war. The Indians talk about a cataclysmic war. They were all talking about some giant war that occurred in the ancient past. And so these stories are not just, you know, told in the book of Enoch. These stories are corroborated by other cultures saying, yes, these things did happen. These other cultures are all telling these stories. And that is evidence that these things once happened because you don't get people all over the world all randomly making up the exact same fiction. That doesn't happen. They're all coming from the same starting point and they get embellished over time, but they're all coming from the same starting point. Something that actually occurred. So I'm just going to cut it off here. This video is already too long, but my point for this video is really to just open your eyes to help you see that what the Book of Enoch has to say is corroborated by all of the ancient cultures of the world, all of the ancient cultures tell stories about these gods coming to earth, teaching mankind all sorts of things, marrying and having children and having giants, and ultimately fighting a cataclysmic war that wreaked a ton of destruction. This is a common thread throughout all of the ancient cultures, and the Book of Enoch is corroborated by all of these cultures. So even though it's kind of a wild story to read, it actually makes a lot of sense when you understand that this is what all of the cultures in the world were saying happened. These people who lived much closer to those events were all saying, yes, this happened. And now scholars today will all say, no, that was all mythology. No, that didn't actually happen. It's just all like stories and myths and stuff they made up. The problem I have with that, among many problems I have with that, is that 
these scholars are essentially saying, we know better about the ancient history than the people did who lived shortly after that. And that's garbage. There's that, That's just total garbage. I mean, who do you think would know more about the events of World War II? People living today or people living 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years from now? Who's going to be able to give a better account of what happened? The answer is people living today. It's going to be a more accurate representation. However, these scholars living today look back at these events that occurred thousands of years ago, and they act like they know more and know better than the cultures who lived at that time. And that's ridiculous. All of these cultures are saying this happened. The scholars cannot accept that it happened because their entire worldview is built on the premise that we evolved from monkeys and came from caves and that we have progressed in a more or less linear progression ever since. Starting in caves, now we're up here at a technological age. And the fact is, that idea of that growth does not fit the actual evidence given to us by the Book of Enoch, by the Bible, as well as all of the ancient cultures of the world who all said the same story that the Bible and the Book of Enoch say. We need to start to recognize that the history we've been taught our entire lives is not accurate, it does not fit the evidence, and it is part of the ideology they want us to have. They want us to accept evolution, they want us to accept the history of the earth as they present it to us, and so they discount things that should be evidence, they discount it and they say it's not evidence, it's, it's fiction, it's mythology. Never mind the fact that everyone in the world in the ancient times, all over the world, were all saying the same thing. Never mind that, forget it, don't worry about it. And so that's why I wanna just go over this really quickly in this video is because, yes, the Book of Enoch tells us a wild story. It's, it's a crazy story about these things that happened, but we shouldn't let that turn us off to it. We shouldn't let that be something that we just dismiss it because the fact is it actually fits what all of the other cultures of the world were saying. And in the next video, we're going to look at how it also fits the evidence that still exists today. Archaeological evidence that still exists today backs up the Book of Enoch and all of these other cultures that told these wild stories. And so that's what we're going to look at in the next video. I hope that this video was helpful for you to get kind of a bird's eye view of what the ancient cultures of the world were saying. Because as I said at the beginning, don't take any of this as the sum of the argument. It's not. This is a brief overview that's hardly giving any of the argument. And there are entire YouTube channels out there that are already arguing exactly what I'm saying. Only they're, they typically come from the ancient aliens idea. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. You know, understand where they're coming from, but there are entire YouTube channels out there that this is what they talk about and this is what they argue, and so I can hardly even scratch the surface. So don't at all feel like, well, I'm not convinced by what you had to say, therefore what you're saying is wrong. Like, no, go look into it. I'm not trying to convince you. I'm trying to just get you started. <laughs> so go check these things out because it's really interesting and it really helps us understand where we've come from because these things are really important for us to understand because first of all, as I've been saying throughout this series, one of the biggest reasons that Christians don't understand a lot of the stuff that's said in the Bible is because they don't understand our own history. They don't know where we've come from. And it helps to know the book of Enoch because Jesus and the apostles corroborated this book and said it's true. But it also is helpful to understand that all of the ancient cultures of the world corroborated this book and said it's true. So yeah, I'm gonna leave it there. Um, please join us in the next video where we look at the archeological evidence because there's a ton of it out there. So I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks for joining.